Years ago, there was a late night talk show on TV, and the announcer, I forgot his name, opened that talk show with one phrase, here's Johnny. He was referring to Johnny Carson, the star of that show. Today, we can look at the scriptures and say, here's Johnny, John the Baptist. We hear how John was conceived miraculously. Zachariah was beyond the age of having children. His wife was as well. They were an older couple. And we don't know how old. They could have been 30, for all we know. But the usual birth age was a lot younger. And they were determined to be, quote, barren, which meant that she would not be able to have a child. And when a person was, a woman was barren, it was looked upon almost like a deserving punishment for whatever sin she or her ancestors committed. So they were faithful to God, even though they were suffering this humiliation before society being barren. And he, as a priest of God, remained faithful, knowing, not knowing, believing God hears his prayer and God in his own good time would answer it. And one of his prayers was, of course, that his wife would conceive and they would have a child. And that's where this story from Luke begins. He's in the temple offering sacrifice and the angelos, the messenger of God, this time named Gabriel, same one who announced to Mary that she would be the mother of God, announces to John, his father, Zechariah, that they would have a child. <laughs> and he was so astounded, he went mute. The angel told him, you went mute because you doubted God. Okay. So we have a, a spiritual reason for his muteness. And he goes home and he tells his wife that. And his wife, according to custom, goes into what we call seclusion. Women who were pregnant were not seen in public for a while. So she went into conclusion. Now the, the key to this whole story, and it comes from Luke, and when stories come from Luke, you, always, you almost can imagine Mary, the mother of Jesus, telling Luke these stories later on after the resurrection of Jesus. And Luke, as a historian, would be interested. Luke is also the one who wrote Acts of the Apostles. So he became interested in this, and I could just see him sitting at the feet of Mary, and she's telling you, wait until you hear about this one. You already heard about the Angelos Gabriel coming to me. The Angelos, the messenger of God, also went to my cousin Elizabeth. And so miraculously, she became pregnant. This is the beginning of the life of the person who would point to Jesus. This is the beginning of the life of John the Baptist. And he was in a tradition, according to Luke and, and the ancient scriptures, he was in a tradition of being a chosen, quote, priest, a chosen person who took no wine, no hard liquor, and his ancestor is Samson. You know, Samson who conquered the Philistines and knocked down the temple because he he doubted God's fidelity. Samson was a priest whose hair was not to be cut and he was not to take strong liquor or wine. And when he did, of course, he was punished. We know that from the Old Testament history. So we have 
John coming on the scene in a very interesting traditional process honoring his ancestors and honoring the Christ who will come. And I use this finger specifically because John is the one who pointed out to the public who the Christ would be. Just imagine the author, Luke, being told these stories. Th this is our history as Christians. And it doesn't go back to John or Jesus. It goes back to their ancestors. So as we gather and we do something that we do every year of our Christian lives, decorate, prepare, light the Advent wreath, we are in the tradition of our ancestors of the Old Testament and the early New Testament. And now a little bit of sadness because the area in which they came from, the Holy Land, is under attack. Between Gaza and Israel, bombs, weapons, anger, hate, jealousy, prejudice, power, and all the other deeds of the devil are there. These today, right, right now as we speak. You can just imagine Mary's sadness that the hometown in which he grew up, in which John proclaimed Jesus, in which Jesus grew up, is now under attack and being destroyed one day after another with bombs and suicide bombers. This is not a religious war. It is between the enemies of Israel and the Palestinians, but it's a war of Satan. There are so many times in our history that Satan has reared his head, has come up and showed the world how powerful he is. And we're doing the festivities that we're preparing and singing and, and looking forward to December 24th and 5th. And Satan's upset with that. So what does he do? He encourages the other side of celebration. And, and, and you know what it is. Read the papers, listen to the, the news, the, the, the parties that get out of hand, the, the celebrations that really produce anger and, and drunkenness, the, the greed that rises up in face of the amount of poverty we have in our own city. That's Satan trying to discourage you from preparing the way of the Lord that John the Baptist foretold. And there's no doubt Satan hates Jesus, hates the concept of Jesus' work in the world, and yet he's very, very alert and active. So as we come to church and we seek shelter and, and, and the warmth of the liturgy and, and, and the lights and, and the Advent read, uh, that's appropriate. But realize we're facing Satan. We're in the face of the wind and power of Satan. So more and more, it's happening for 2,000 years, more and more we have to let our faith be known. Whether it's lighting a candle carefully so it doesn't hurt anybody, put on the tree, put up the little nativity, share with someone. The more we do that, the more Satan is upset with us. But do it. Share faith. Share love. Share joy. Through the centuries, we've had people rise up and give us a direction, like the author of the beautiful hymns, like Silent Night. Through history, these authors have risen up and given us hymns and songs to sing. And in history, John the Baptist gave us a direction 
in history. Elizabeth becomes a role model. I mean, Mary, another role model in history. And I say in history because, again, these are not myths. These are not stories that we read at night to go to bed and go to sleep. These are not fairy tales. This is our history. These people are our ancestors in faith. And as we look back to their origins, we realize the historical geographic area of the world from which they came is in turmoil. And whatever good you try to do, Satan will try to undo. Whatever good the church tries to do, Satan will attempt to undo. No mystery. Look at John's reward for being the one who was the precursor of Jesus, pointing to Jesus. He lost his head to Herod because of jealousy and other accusations. And Jesus himself, born in the, and in, in, in the period of threat, born while he was in Bethlehem under surveillance because the soldiers of the king wanted him gone. He was threatening. The beautiful story of the nativity, the, the lambs, the sheep, the cows, all that was a threat to Satan and still is. And you and I continue to threaten Satan. The more we practice our faith, the more we share the elements of our faith, the more we understand it and integrate it into our hearts and into our charity and into our love, the more we're offending Satan, but defending God and promulgating his dear mother Mary. It's funny. Most people would come to church in the midst of all the, the festivities and the candles and the lights and the trees and the nativity going up here and the other nativity statues going up and Cabrini and, and, and feel joy. And we should feel joy in a cloudy, darkened world. John the Baptist is our precursor. He pointed to Jesus so that we can also point to Jesus in our lives, in our actions, and most of all, in our love, imitating the word incarnate, Jesus Christ. Cousin of John the Baptist, nephew of Elizabeth, child of Mary.